elaborate on the story. <laughs> <laughs> love you, man. Love, love you, brother. God bless you. Good morning, brothers. Good morning. So good to be here with you. Thank you, brother Rudy, for the worship, man. Um, it is good to be in, uh, with brothers who just uh, love the Lord early on a Thursday morning. We could be sleeping or getting ready to go to work, though, but it's getting time to get together and to encourage one another and to get in God's word. So um, it's an honor and privilege to be here. Um, yeah, that story, uh, again, it, it was a faith journey. I felt like it was like an Abraham uh, journey as far as coming, leaving Virginia, coming here to California to do the church plant uh, with Pastor Ray. Um, but, you know, it wouldn't change any other thing. But I, I, I'll tell you this, though. One thing that um, before I made the call was I was on my knees in prayer. Um, I think uh, there's one thing that's very lacking in the church today, and also I'm just thinking around our country, is that uh, we don't pray. You know, uh, our prayers really don't reach the ceiling because we're not in tune with what the Lord is saying. And um, that's my desire is always to be in step with him, that to catch that wave of the Holy Ghost and to be in, and move with him. So um, and that takes, you know, being on your knees, crying out to God, saying, God, what will you have me to do? Because I don't want to do that on my own um, an initiative or my own uh, flesh. I want to be led by the spirit. And I am here today because God called me here. God called me and my family to San Diego um, to help with that church plant with my brother and um, wouldn't change it. So again, um, it, it's a, a humbling thing. And again, a river church, and y'all heard Pastor Ray, he's been here, I mean, they're my family. Zach's my, that's my brother, you know. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I'm my blood brother though, but he is my, I love him uh, so much, love his family. And I, again, um, what I love doing is, is pouring courage into brothers. That's called encouragement. That's my gift, a gift of encouragement. And I want to encourage the souls this morning with the topic about prayer. And as Brother Rudy said, today is the National Day of Prayer. And um, I, I want to uh, pray this prayer by uh, my mentor and pastor, uh, Dr. Tony Evans, who is the honorary chap I mean, chairman this year for a National Day of Prayer. And he um, designed a prayer that will be read um, uh, noontime across the nation. And I, I want to pray it today um, as we just kind of think and reflect about praying for our country, uh, praying for our communities, praying for our families. And it starts with us men. Because I remember just growing up, you know, uh, going to prayer meetings. And I generally, I just remember as a little boy, when I would kind of sit up in the back pew, the majority of people who were there were women. And again, none to give sisters, you know, I praise God for that. But I, I always kind of asked my father, because I said, Dad, where, where are the men at? Why, why don't the men come to these prayer meetings? Because the prayer meetings like, last for a good two, three hours. And the women would be wailing, calling out to God. And I was just, just trying to understand uh, why not many men would be coming to the prayer meeting. And my dad would just say, you know, he says, stuff like this, man, I mean, you, you really have to be in tune and step with the Lord. And... Um, I just really pray that, you know, in our churches today, that men will take the lead in prayer. We're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 2, so if you want to kind of turn there. But I want to pray this prayer um, by Tony Evans as we think about our country today. Um, and you can close your eyes or just look at me, however you want to do it. But um, it's a very uh, prayer in tune that we could lift up our nation. It says, Heavenly Father, we come to you today as humble people, I'm going to say as humbly, humble men, desperate for your supernatural intervention on behalf of our beloved nation. First, we thank you for all the blessings you have bestowed on our land, blessings that have allowed us to bring so much good and benefit to not only our own citizens, but also to the rest of the world. The very ideals upon which this country was founded were based on biblical truths, no matter how some try to rewrite history to deny that fact buried today. This is why our hearts are so broken on how you continue to be marginalized and dismissed by both our people and our institutions. We are also saddened by the fact that your people have contributed greatly to the spiritual ap apathy, excuse me, that now engulfs us. Our satisfaction in remaining religious without being fully committed to living out the truths of your word has caused us to become co-conspirators with the forces of evil that are destroying us as a society. It is for this reason that we personally and collectively repent for our carnality 
and recommit ourselves to become visible and verbal disciples of Jesus Christ. Enable us by your spirit to no longer be secret agent Christians, but rather to publicly declare and live out your truth in a spirit of love so that you feel welcome in our country once again. Thank you for your promise to hear our prayers when we call to you with hearts of repentance and obedience, which is how we are appealing to you today, Father. On behalf of your church, we affirm and afresh the priority you are to us that you will fill every dimension of our lives as we seek to bring you glory through the advancement of your kingdom in our personal lives, our family lives, in the lives of our churches and our government leaders. We confidently invite heaven's intervention into all the affairs of our nation, and we praise you in advance for your answer. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So again, as we just we open today, we're going to talk about the importance of prayer and how men should take the lead in prayer. So we are in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Um, but before I, I, I'm going to read eight verses, I, I want to read a verse also that's very familiar when it comes to, you know, praying for our nation. Uh, it was in Second, Second Chronicles, and uh, the setting is um, the dedication of the temple. Solomon is dedicating the temple to the Lord, and um, it's a very powerful verse that we, we've heard plenty of times, but I, I want to focus on two important words as I read it. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14, and we know it well. And my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves. It begins there, brothers. Humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. And then notice what Jesus, God says will happen. Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. That needs to happen in America today. But I believe it starts with men coming to the coming. To the, to the table and say, you know, I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to pray. I'm going to take the lead. As Joshua always said in, in Joshua 24, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What has to happen is that we have to um, have this appetite, this attitude of prayer. But I think we kind of see prayer as just, you know, a quick rote um, couple of words and this kind of, you know, okay, I, I, about my day. But prayer is just talking and communing, communing with God. And see, what God wants us to do is to humble ourselves and seek his face. Because we definitely need uh, healing in our country today. And I think what needs to happen in America as far as our, our nation is that we need to be praying for the upcoming election. And again, I'm not going to get on to whether, you know, I know there's two people. There's the Democrat and the Republican uh, ticket. And all God calls us to do is to really pray for that man and that lady who are running for the highest position in the land. He wants us to pray. He doesn't want us to criticize. He calls us to pray for those who will be in authority. And I think sometimes that's easier said than done because, again, we, we feel that, you know, our, we are, our country was founded on um, biblical principles and we've gone so far to the left we're like, okay, something has to happen. I gotta, you know, make a stand. But making a stand, brother, is on your knees. Making a stand is on your knees in prayer. And that your kids seeing you on your knees praying, your wife seeing you praying for this country. And I wanna talk about it in First Timothy chapter two. So if your Bibles are your phones, uh, let's turn there real quickly. And uh, Paul was writing to his young protege, Timothy, um, because Timothy was a pastor at the Church of Ephesus, and he was giving him some counsel about how to run the church. And he talks about, in chapter 2, about how public worship should be set in order. The first eight verses talk about the men, and the, the last one talks about the, uh, the females. So in 1 Timothy, chapter 2, he says, First of all, then I urge that your entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving be made on behalf to all men. What he's saying here is that we have to be, have this, um, is the word, evangelistic praying mindset. We're praying for the lost. 
because he's saying you're in Ephesus and you have a church in, in the, this big community called Ephesus, this L.A., the la-la land of the day. He says, and you are supposed to be the light. So what you have to do is pray, give thanks and for behalf of all men that men will be saved. Because, see, that's what we're being called to do is to be ambassadors for Christ, to point people to Jesus Christ. Not necessarily pick it, but we are to be a light to the world. And it begins by not necessarily preaching, but prayer. Paul says, I urge you, I'm pleading with you, Timothy, that your entreaties, your prayers, your petitions, and thanksgiving, thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, that men will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because at one time, guys, you and I were slaves to sin. You know, we were wandering aimlessly, blinded by this world, but somebody prayed for us. So what God has called you and I to do is to be praying on behalf of men that they will be reconciled back to God. And then he goes in verse 2, says, For kings and all who are in authority, so that they may leave, that we may leave a, a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. He doesn't say, Timothy, that we should be praying, I mean, criticizing those in authority. He says that we should be praying for them. A lot of times that when we, uh, we, we had no problem praying for our family members or for our loved ones, but when the, the prayer roll goes around, like, let's pray for our bosses or <laughs> praying for that, that, that neighbor who's so annoying. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. And, and especially for those who may be, I mean, in authority. But Paul's saying, hey, Timothy, pray for the kings and those who are in authority. And some, some, some of y'all people who are Bible scholars are here, at this time, who is the head honcho in Rome at this time that Paul's talking to? About? Who's the head man? No, Nero. 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 Nero is the head honcho at this time. Now, now let me talk about Nero. Nero was a madman. He, he was out of his mind. He, he was killing Christians. And Paul tells Timothy, he says that we're to pray for those in authority. Nero is also the one responsible for killing Paul. Now, that, that's amazing. He says that we're to pray for those who are in authority so that we may live a tranquil and quiet life. Because, see, here's the thing that always catches, my, catches me is that people are always watching me, especially sinners. They're they waiting for me to curse and swear and talk about the ball. They're waiting. They're waiting for it. But they don't talk again. They, if you talk about Jesus or, you know, you, I mean, you smile on your face, they, they, they're trying to find something negative about you. But when we are men of prayer, we, li we live lives that are quiet and tranquil. Because God says that we're to pray for those who are in authority. And then he says, verse 3, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. It pleases God when we have that tranquil and quiet life and we are men of prayer. And this is what God desires, verse 4. He desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. It is God's desire that all men come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. All men won't because, see, God gives men a free will. He doesn't force his hand on anyone. He gives you an opportunity to say, you know, do you want me or do you, are you going to reject me? But he, he, his desire is that all men be saved. So we are to live our lives um, uh, in prayer, but we're pointing people toward Jesus Christ. And we might not know if that person is going to receive it or reject it, but all we're going to do is just plant that seed. And I, I was studying the, um, the Gospels, and I was looking at Luke, and I was noticing every time before Jesus did anything miraculous, miraculous as far as calling his disciples or doing miracles, it said that he would go to a quiet place and pray. He would go to a quiet, quiet place and pray to the Father. See, Jesus knew that he couldn't do anything apart to apart from connecting with the Father. Now, Jesus could do it. We need to be doing, I mean, be in prayer to the Father, constantly about everything, how to, to love our wives, how, how to raise our children. But it's amazing to me. 
that Jesus, before he did anything that very powerful, he would go and commune with the Father. But his desire is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But we know our enemy, he's trying to blind the minds of this world. But see, all he calls us to do is to live that life that's tranquil and of peace and be men of prayer and point people to the Savior. He says, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator and between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He was the, the God-man. He is the, in, the go-between between God and man. He is the bridge that that we cross over to get back to God. Because, see, um, God is in pursuit of us. We are we're enemies of God, we, 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 I mean, because of our sin. But God is pursuing us, and it took Jesus to build that bridge to bring God and man back together. For there is one God and one mediator, and also God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And notice what he did in verse 6. He gave himself a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. He willingly gave his life. He was the ransom. He, I mean, uh, God poured all his wrath on Jesus. Christ became sin for us that we might have life. And that's the good news. That's the good news that we are to be uh, presenting to people. But it starts with a humble, humble heart and an attitude of prayer. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because I want us to look at, again, our role as men of prayer. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says in verse 20, it says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. That means that we are representatives for Christ. It says, as though God were making an appeal through us, and we beg on your behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That is the message. To, t to tell people, that, hey, come back to God. God wants to receive you. That's, that's, that's our message. But I think at times we feel that we have to do more, and really, we don't. All we have to do is to speak out the message and let the Holy Spirit do the work. And we get frustrated because we're feeling that we have to do the work. God just tells us to be ambassadors. Just present the message. Hey, be reconciled back to God. Be reconciled. Back. God loves you. He has a plan for you. Be reconciled back to him. And we, we, we got to really just trust and allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in, the man, I mean, in men and women's lives. And it begins with prayer. A lot of times, see, again, that's why going back to a little boy, see, uh, it was very popular with the, the Bible studies. People want to come and hear, you know, the pastor preach on a word, though, but the prayer meetings were so, it, 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 nobody, nobody came. It was like, it was very, very small. Because, see, people feel that, you know, prayer is it, it, really hard to do, and I'm talking to somebody I can't see, and and then I, you know, I'm, I'm falling asleep after maybe 15 minutes. I mean, come on. It's, you know, but, but prayer, it begins there. I mean, the, the, the fuel to a victorious Christian life is the power of prayer. We have to be men of prayer because, see, when prayer happens, especially when men pray, goodness, when men pray, things happen. Things truly happen. And trust me, I think... Our women want to see us in prayer. I mean, because, um, again, as a little boy, seeing all those women there, I guarantee you they probably were praying and calling out to God that their husbands would be, be there with them, probably. So we have to take the lead in that. But we got to recognize that the Holy Spirit is the one that does the work. Because verse 21 says, He made him who knew no sin, that's Christ, to be sin on our behalf. So we know Christ became sin for us who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. So the great exchange. He took our sin, and he gave us righteousness. That's good news. And that's what we should be, be telling people, be reconciled back to God. But it's, it begins with the power of prayer. 
I, I, just, I just think about that. I, I, I remember this growing up also in my household. Uh, my dad would have the Christian radio blasting constantly, Christian music. And it wasn't like, you know, I mean, I'm from the old school. It wasn't the, the, the gospel stuff. I mean, we had Andre Crouch, though, but we had, um, that, oh, Andre Crouch, yeah. But we had um, a lot of the hymns, those hymns, and they, they'd be just playing. I was like, oh, my goodness. It was like, really, you know? But um, my dad says, you need to sit down and listen to what, the, what they're saying. And then when I got to seminary, I really began to appreciate the, the history behind the hymns. And like, you know, just knowing about, you know, about what Christ did. So um, I just remember being awakened one night um, by this, you know, somebody just stumping and screaming out. It was my dad. I was kind of, I would tiptoe into the room. He's calling out to God, Lord, Lord, save my, my family, save, you know, my, my, my brothers, my sisters. Let my sons be men of God. I mean, he's, he's calling out to God. And it was just a, a, a visual for me, just like, wow, it just impacted me so much. So guess what? Today, I'm doing the same thing. And my little eight-year-old, he came up one night, and he kind of like, Daddy, what are you doing? Just praying. And I said, little man, I hope that you could be doing the same thing. Because again, I'm, my point is, they're watching us, and it impacts you when a man prays. It, it impacted me. I want to see my daddy pray for me and for, 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 for his, his country and for his, his church and for his family. Um, we need to pray. But I, I want to close with a, a story. Um, remember Elijah. Elijah is known for calling fire down from heaven, right? Remember the, the prophets of Baal? They just, you know, doing all their little stuff. And he's kind of kind of joking on them and say, you know, but yell, scream, and maybe he's go, going to the bathroom. And, you know, they, they're doing all that stuff. And then all... Then Elijah gets up and does his altar thing, pours water on the altar, and he just said, you know, God just calls fire down, and everybody just goes, Pfft. And I was, thought, I was thought about the story. I said, how in the world did a man, you know, like Elijah, have that kind of power? Let's turn to James chapter 5. I'm going to close with this, because, you know, I, I was like, how in the world, because calling fire down from heaven, what did, what, what did this guy do? And um, James kind of alludes to this story because he talks to the, um, he's talking about prayer, actually. And in verse 16, notice this, James says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And then he says, the effective prayer of the righteous man can accomplish much. He says, the effective, fervent, Prayer of the righteous man can accomplish much. If you are, <laughs> if you want to be effective, okay, and if you're already righteous because you belong to Christ, your prayers can accomplish much. Okay? Don't, don't miss that. It can accomplish much. But do we really believe that? We, we can't be praying, Lord, uh, uh, I come to you today, and I'm hoping that you know, you're going to see me through. Hoping. We, we got to pray in, in confidence and believe that we know God's going to move. Right? Because, see, a lot of times we pray, and it's not even hitting the, the ceiling because we don't have that, you know, effective, fervent prayer. Believing that God, by faith, is going to do what he said he's going to do. The effective prayer of the righteous man can accomplish much. Notice this, verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. So James trying to say he was no super saint. He was a guy just like us. Put on his pants just like us, his shirt. Went to the bathroom, a regular guy, bad, you know, a regular brother. He was a man with nature like ours. So you don't got to feel like, you know, he, he's high, he's just like you. Notice, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for how many times? I'm all? Three and a half years. Not just one day. Now, we've been in a drought here in St. Nico about you know, a drought, though, but this brother prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. Now, how in the world did he do that? Because again, he was a righteous man, he, a man of faith. And he accomplished much. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So he said, you know what, Lord, I come to you today. You the God of the universe. You the God of the rain. I'm praying that it will not rain 
for three and a half years. He didn't reign for three and a half years. King Ahab and Jezebel, they, they worried. And, I mean, then for three and a half years. Verse 18. Then he prayed again after three and a half years, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. He prayed again. But see, it only happened because this guy was in tune and step with the Lord. He was a man of faith. And see, God said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to hear his prayer because, see, he, he, believes, his, he believes what he's talking about. He, he knows me. And see, that's what it takes, too, about just do you know him intimately? Not just about him or knowing things about the Bible. But do you know him intimately? Are you sitting at his feet daily? Are you praying without ceasing? And see, what, that, that's what the Lord wants from us, men. But for this nation to move, it's going to take men, effective, fervent men of faith to change this country in prayer. In prayer. There should be a rise of more, I'm praying for a rise of more prayer meetings than necessarily Bible studies. That's what I'm praying for. More prayer meetings. And we say sin revival, it begins with prayer. Now somebody come up here talking in the pulpit, and that's all well good, but I'm saying it begins with men on their knees in prayer. And why can't it start right here on Thursday morning? Well, we come together and lock on and say, you know what? Lord, I'm lifting up my family. I'm lifting up this community. I'm lifting up this city for the glory of God. Amen. Not just, just talk about it, but let's do it. And what I want to do right now, I, I, I want to close in prayer, but I want us to, to link up with two, two or three brothers. And I want us to be praying right now for two things, for three things, actually. I want us to pray for our families, that we will take the lead in our families and be men of prayer. But I want to also pray for our churches, that our leaders, our pastors, will take the throne, I mean, go to the throne of grace and pray for their communities, but also pray for our nation that our nation will turn back to God. That's what I want to pray about. So I'm going to close in prayer, but then I want us to link up with three other brothers, and we're just, going to, we're just going to pray. We're going to pray for those three things. Let's pray now. Lord, thank you again for your goodness and your mercy, Lord. And I just thank you for each man here, Lord, because I believe that these men desire, Lord, to seek you and desire, Lord, to see change. Lord, I pray, Lord, that... The effective prayer of a righteous man, and there's righteous men in this room today, can accomplish much. Lord, we want to see great things happen, Lord. We want our prayers to reach the throne of grace. And Lord, that only happens, Lord, as we just touch and agree with one another, Lord, as we pray for our families, as we pray for this community, as we pray for the church and we pray for this nation, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we, I pray that you will move. You will hear from us, Father God. We humble ourselves, Lord, and we just pray for healing for this land. We love you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So what can we do? Thank you. What we can do is just link up with some... Um